In today's test automation experience, we're joined by Kristen Jack Bonney, Principal Engineer at Paylocity. We get into a bunch of testing topics, such as how to test a text field, crowd testing, mobile testing, upload testing, security testing, how to measure quality, and so much more. My name is Nikolai Atlatkin, and please join me on this test automation experience. Hey everyone, welcome to the Test Automation Experience. Today, we're joined by the wonderful Kristen Jacoboni. If you're unfamiliar with Kristen, she discovered her love of software testing in 2009 after a career in music education. She's been a QA lead, manager, software development engineer in test, and currently working as principal engineer at Paylocity. She believes in good testing begins with good thinking, knowing why you're testing, planning what to test, and determining the best way to test it. Kristen, welcome to the show. I am so, so excited to have you here today because we have so much to talk about. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Where are you joining us from? I am in Rhode Island. Rhode Island, beautiful. And what is your favorite food? Oh boy, that'd be hard to say. Probably chocolate. <laughs> if we're thinking about like nutritious and not nutritious, I think, I think I'd go with chocolate. <laughs> Amazing. I love chocolate too. I'm a chocoholic. And if you had to pick one place to live, where would you live? Well, probably New Hampshire. And my husband and I have actually purchased some property in New Hampshire that we're going to be putting a house on at some point. I actually used to live in New Hampshire. I was there for about 15 years. So I'm excited to go back. It's just so beautiful there. Oh, that's amazing. When are you going to be making it out there? I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, we've got to, you know, find a contractor and, and all of that, but, but we have the land. So it's like, there's no big rush because the land is there. It's paid for. It's ours. We can go visit it. We just have no house to live in. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, that's awesome. Congratulations on that. Thanks. And very excited for you today. The reason I brought you on the show was you have an amazing book, the complete software tester concepts, skills, and strategies for high quality testing. It's a book that's very practical with lots of wonderful tactical advice on how to test almost everything there is. There's so many things to test, but you covered so many topics. And I'd love to just dive into a bunch of questions and ask you to teach us how do we test different things and different systems and so on in the world. What do you think are your top five key takeaways from your book. I think the most important thing is to know what you don't know. When I first started in software testing, when I first discovered that software testing was a thing and that I loved it and I wanted to do it, I wanted to get as much information as I could about it. And one of the things that I found was that it was hard for me to ask the right questions because I didn't even know what the words were for the thing that I was trying to do. Like I remember in about 2012, I took a testing job where they wanted me to write test automation. And I didn't, I had never done that before. I'd had a couple of programming classes and I had been a tester for a few years. So I figured I could do this. And I told them, yeah, sure, I can do this. I can figure this out. And then I was trying to write test automation and and I would be struggling with something and I'd be like, you know, I, I'm trying to find this element or I'm trying to, you know, do a loop or, or something like that. But I didn't even have the right words to ask the question of somebody else. Like, how do I do X? And so what I'm really hoping that my book will be a jumping off point for is that like people can read a little bit about a whole bunch of different kinds of testing. And then when they do have a question or when they do have something that they want to move forward, on, they'll know the right words to use to, to, you know, do those web searches or find that mentor or that course where they can continue. So, so I think that's probably like the, the biggest thing that I'm hoping that people will get out of it. The second biggest thing is I want to make sure that people understand that testing is not software development. Testing is a very different skill from software development. Yes, it's important to have those software development skills because test automation is important because we can't all test manually or we will never release any software ever. But we need to understand that 
the most important thing, the thing that you really have to start with is think about what is it that you are trying to test and why are you trying to test it? Like, you know, what, what are you trying to ensure? What are you trying to, you know, what problems are you trying to find? So, so I'm hoping that, that people in reading this book, they'll understand the importance of really thinking about what to test before they start diving into just automating everything. So I can't remember how many top points you asked me about, but those are the top two. <laughs> I asked, I asked for five, but you, you gave two, but those are awesome. And it, <laughs> it opens up so many questions already. And we have so many more. One question that I was going to ask you about was you talked about how your book, you were hoping your book will help people to know what they don't know, which it certainly does that. It's, it's really wonderful that you can just go in there and be like, how do I test? mobile? How do I test web? How do I do security testing, accessibility, and so on? So many little areas to kind of get started on. But where did you go first when you encountered that problem? How did you figure out the right questions to ask and even the right terminology? Yeah, it was hard. So back when, when I was starting to learn about this in, in 2012, there were not all of the, the wonderful resources that we have now. There were not people like you writing great blog posts. There were not people like Angie Jones, you know, doing great presentations. So I did a lot of Google searching. I actually was was working with Sauce Labs at the time. So yeah, because they, they were out there and, and they were a platform by which you could run your tests. And so so I was using them. Yeah, you know, just a lot of, lot of Google searches. And then one of the things that I learned, which was a real eye opener for me, is I didn't understand really how important it was to have good quality code when you're writing your test automation. So I was figuring it all out myself. I mean, it was a lot of spaghetti code and a lot of repetitive stuff. And, and at the company where I was working, they had hired a new software developer and to just get him familiar with the project you know, of, of, that we were working on, they thought, oh, well, let's have this guy take a look at the automated tests. He looked at them and he completely cleaned them up, like, you know, abstracted code out and, you know, just did things in a cleaner way. And at first I was really embarrassed because I was like, oh, you know, I didn't realize that my code was so bad. But then I realized that it was actually a learning experience, that that this was very valuable for me and that I could take this and and use it everywhere else. Another thing that was really helpful at that time was the guys I worked with were just great and they were really good about answering questions. And so so I could I walk up to one of them and say, there's this thing I'm trying to do. I don't know what it's called, but let me explain to you what it might be like. And, and then, oh, you want to do such and such. And so then they'd give me the name for it and they'd show me how to do it. And that was really helpful. So I, I think a really important thing is when you're getting started with, with writing test automation, you need to make sure that you're not embarrassed to ask stupid questions. I asked a whole lot of stupid questions, but you know, people, people don't say, oh, that woman, she's an idiot. They say, here's someone who wants to learn. And, and, and most people, you know, especially people who know how to check their ego at the door, most people are really good about helping you and giving you like the information that you need because they want you to succeed because you're a team member. So yeah, so definitely do not be afraid to ask stupid questions. That's such a good point about stupid questions, Kristen. Even recently when I started working at Sauce Labs, I came in with a strong C-sharp background, some Java background, but then I had to pick up JavaScript because so many of our customers are using JavaScript. And all I did was ask, stupid questions. And I was like, how does this work? And actually what happened was exactly what you said was one of our amazing solution architects, Wim Sells, who knows JavaScript really well. He was like, wow, Nikolai really is interested and curious and wants to learn JavaScript versus thinking on oh, this guy's, you know, an idiot and doesn't know what he's doing. And so it was a positive aspect kind of, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's been my, my whole experience working in, in software, which I've been doing now since 2009, has been people are generally really friendly and helpful. They want to help you because they know they know what it's like to be stuck and lost because programming is so complicated. So everybody's been stuck and lost and everybody has wanted to have that person who says, hey, let me help you out with this. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm really happy I'm in the field I'm in. 
Yeah, totally makes sense. And oh, one other thing I was going to say for anyone about the clean code that you were talking about. Say, same here, by the way, in terms of creating lots of horrible code. My friend Titus Fortner jokes about how you can only get good at automation after you develop and mess up four frameworks. And then on the <laughs> fifth one, you get around, it's like, yeah, that sounds about right. So some resources that really helped me was Clean Code by Robert Martin and Clean Architecture. Those two really, really helped me step up my coding game and make code that's easy to read, easy to understand, easy to maintain. Yeah, yeah. All right, next question, Kristen. So how do we test a text field? Well, there are so many ways, and and that's actually one of the, the questions I've done. I, I don't do this one in interviews now, but I used to do this at previous companies. Is one like especially if I was hiring like a, a new tester or maybe like a test like an intern or something, I would just draw a little picture with a text field and a button that said submit, and I'd be like, okay, here you go. How do you test this? And I mean, there's so so first of all, there's the the limits of what can go in the field. And so, well, actually, even before that, there's what can go in the field, like what kind of data type can go in the field. So like, can you put a, a string in it of text? Can you put an integer in it? Can you use decimal points? Can you put symbols? Can you put emojis? And so, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is once you can figure out like what goes in there and what doesn't go in there, then you think about what are the limits? So if it is a text field, can you have like, you know, 300 characters in it? Can you have 3000 characters in it? Can you have just one character in it? Sometimes there are text fields where you say you have to have at least five characters in this field, like for example, with a password. And then if it's something like a numeric field, can you, you know, can you have like, is it an int or is it a uh, float? Um, you know, so can you like, can you have decimal points? Can you have like, you know, 256 of like, you know, numbers in it? Can you have like, so those, those are all the kinds of limits, negative numbers. Can you have negative numbers? Can you have zero? What are the limits you put on that? And then, then you think about what if it's a date field? What if it's a currency field? What if it's a phone number field? Then you've got all kinds of different parameters that, that you need to test. And so that's just all for like, one field, you know, and then you're not even thinking about the save button. Like what happens if you click the save button twice? What if you happens if you click the save button, there's nothing in the field. And what happens if you click the save button and then you go back? Does it remember the item that was saved or does it forget? So yeah, there's just so much to do with that one field. And, and I like to also, I have a college course that I'm usually a guest speaker at for like one session where I introduce software developers to the concepts of testing. And that's the first thing I do with them is I say, how are you going to test this? And they're usually amazed thinking about all the different different ways you can test it. And actually a lot of times they go straight to cross-site scripting. I'm like, really? You're going to go like right there first? Like, like, like how about like, is it a text field? Like, you know, but let's start with that. But it's, but it's fun to get them to think about that. That's super awesome. And if someone is trying to figure out what the text field is supposed to take in, like the acceptance criteria, how might they figure it out? Well, the best way is you've got a story with like good acceptance criteria in it. <laughs> I mean, that's the absolute best way. Hopefully you've got a, you're part of a team where there's a product owner who's going to be, you know, writing good acceptance criteria and saying like, this is exactly what it is that we're expecting from this field. Even better is if you are actually participating before the acceptance criteria even get written with your developers and your product owner to make sure that everybody understands what exactly is being built and why. Like, why is this text field here? Then we can all talk about what the limits are going to be on it. And then, you know, the acceptance criteria get written from there. Um, I'm a big fan of the three amigos meeting where you've got, you know, at least one tester, at least one developer, at least one product owner. So you're solving problems before even the first line of code gets written. That's cool. Okay, great. Makes sense. Because I feel like sometimes I get these questions of like, how do I f even figure out the requirements? So really, it's hopefully they're present already for you. If not, it's a conversation that we've got to have, which a lot of times, a lot of this is a conversation and an exploration about 
the boundaries of our systems, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I'm a huge fan of exploratory testing. So if you find yourself in a situation like, let's say, for example, if, if you and your teammates are you know, located in, in different parts of the world, and so it's, you know, it's midnight where they are, and you've got something and you're trying to test it, and you're like, there's no acceptance criteria here, I can't talk to the developer because it's midnight, but I want to do some testing here, just explore. Like, find out what happens. I mean, there have been many times where I've been testing something and because I didn't understand the system, I started using it in a way that nobody was expecting me to use it. And then, you know, I can come back and like, you know, the next day when I meet with the developer, I can say, hey, you know what? I put, you know, four different symbols in here and it completely crashed the application. And they'll go, oh, I never even thought to test that. So, so that's, that's good too. Sometimes it's helpful to not know. I mean, I, I definitely think when we are developing software, especially when we're on a timetable that we want to make sure that we've got very clear requirements, everybody's on the same page, but it's also good sometimes to poke around and do things that maybe people haven't thought of. Yeah. hundred percent. Do you have some good resources for us to, if you wanted to learn more about exploratory testing? Yes. The best, best book for this is the book Explore It by Elizabeth Hendrickson. I love that book so much. It is such a great book. Every tester should read that book. All right. Let's talk about CRUD testing. What is that <laughs> and how do we do it? Okay. So CRUD is create, read, update, delete. And so Probably most testers have already been doing this, even if they didn't know that's what the name was. So actually, I'll use an example that I reference in my book. I created a, a simple little web application called the Contact List app that users can use with the book to practice some of the things that I talk about in the book including automation. So it's good for, it's good for UI testing. It's good for API testing. It's good for all kinds of automation. And so, you know, it's just a simple app where you, you log in and then you can create a list of contacts, you know, so you can add people with their name and their phone number, and their address and their birthday. And when we think about like creating a resource, you want to make sure that when you add in a new contact, that that contact looks like it's been saved. Like when you go back to the contact list, you can see your new contact there, but you also want to make sure that that contact is actually in the database too. I mean, sometimes, especially with like, you know, web applications, you can add something and it can look like it's there, but if you navigate away and back again, suddenly it's gone. So you want to make sure that that resource has been really created. And then of course the R stands for read, which is where you want to make sure that you can find that resource in, in your application. You you can click on it and you can get all the information. So it's clearly been retrieved and then update. That's where you edit. You want to make sure that you can edit your contact and the edits are really saved. One of the things to think about a lot here is that the kind of state of each field in, in the contact. So for example, you want to make sure that you can go from like having a null state of like all right, let's just say phone number. So like you've got zero phone number. You want to make sure that you can go from having no phone number for the contact to adding a phone number for the contact and having that contact saved. Similarly, you want to be able to do the opposite. You want to be able to edit so that if you have a phone number that you can get rid of that phone number and then that will save as like a null state. A lot of times, there are bugs like that where it's like, sure, you can add in the, the item, but then you can't get rid of it. So that's important to think about. And then the last thing, of course, is delete. You want to make sure that you can actually delete your resource. There's a couple different ways that deletes happen. Um, one is called like a soft delete, which is where it's marked as deleted in the database so that it's not going to be returned to the web page when you're, when you're looking at the data but it's still actually in the database. And there are reasons why sometimes that happens, you know, a lot of times for like, you know, financial companies or, or companies that need to maintain, you know, pristine records, it'll be in there, it'll have like a flag that says, yes, this is deleted, but it's not really gone. And then there's the hard delete, which is where you delete it, it's gone forever, you're never getting it back. So that's basically what CRUD is. That's super awesome. And maybe to give people a little bit of context, how, they can do it because I, I think there's several ways to do it. Number one 
is through the UI, right? You can navigate the application and perform all those operations in the UI, but then I guess you do have to go back to the database and ensure that it was correctly saved in there. And that approach is good in that you're testing as the end user and you get to see the entire system from the database all the way to the UI. It's bad in that it's slow and time consuming. So maybe another better, faster approach is if it has like a RESTful API where each of the fields are hooked up to, you can just send a web request with whatever data that you want and then make sure you get back the right response. So that's another way to do it. And of course you can do it in an automated way. You can do it in a manual way, but that way is faster. But also you need to be sure that all of those APIs are correctly hooked up to the UI and that the UI displays the right data. And then probably the third way to do it is make changes in the UI or the API and then go in the database and query stuff to ensure that things are correct. Does that yep. sound about right to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I am a huge, huge fan of API testing because it is just, it's so fast. It's so much less flaky than UI testing. And so what I like to tell people is when they talk about, well, what should I test with the API? What should I test with the UI? I always say like, test all of your logic with the API and test every single thing that you can think of with the API. Do security testing with the API. Make sure that your API is secure and that people aren't going to be able to like, you know, grab a request and rerun it to like change your data or something. And then for the UI testing, what you want to do is you just want to test the, the things that you want the user to actually be able to do. Like, so you definitely want to make sure is your submit button there? Because if your submit button isn't there, your user's going to be really, really frustrated. I actually had that happen to me. I was filling out an extremely complicated financial form. This is like in my own personal life. I got to the end, like page like four or five, I hit the submit button and it literally did nothing. It uh. was so unbelievably frustrating and it took like two hours on the phone with the customer support people before I could finally get this form completed. So yeah, you definitely want to make sure your button's there, your user can click the button, the button does what it's supposed to do. So those are the kinds of things you need your UI testing for. But for everything else, you, you want your API testing because you can just burn through tests so fast that way. And beautiful advice. Thank you for that, Kristen. You also mentioned you have a little web application to test. Yeah. Can you drop me that link? So this is something that people can use even if they don't want to buy my book. They can also use it. And there's also an API that goes with it. And you can see on that home page, it says the API documentation can be found here. So people can you know, take that documentation and open it up in Postman and, and putz around. It's, it's a really good way to, for people who are new to API testing, I wanted to create something where they could try out something in the API and then say to themselves, well, did this really work? I mean, I got a 200 response, but I can't really tell. But they could go to the app and then they could see the thing that they added in the API is now in the application, you know, on the web page. So I, I think it's going to be really helpful. That's amazing. Yeah, that's super helpful. I think people love those kind of demo apps to test with, especially with documentation on how to do it. So thank you for creating that. Certainly we'll share it. And then also maybe I'll even explore it and write some tests for it. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. All right. Let's talk about mobile testing. Teach us how to do that. Mobile testing is a big challenge. And that's, that's actually something that I'm working with right now at my company. We are currently rewriting our mobile app. It was written in sort of a hybrid way, and now we're rewriting it natively. So it's been really, really interesting and fun. And it's also a little bit of a coming home for me because when I first discovered software testing, it was at an internship where we were making a mobile app. So uh, mobile apps have a special place in my heart. But I think the first thing you need to think about is what are you going to test on? And obviously, you're going to want to test an Android, test an iOS, assuming your application offers both of those options. And then you need to think about, do you want to test with a device in hand? Or do you want to test with an emulator? Do you want to test with an actual device in the cloud? Probably a combination of all of those things would be really helpful. 
I'm, I'm a fan of having at least a few of our testers having at least one device actually in their hand, because sometimes it's just easier to figure out like, you know, you're hitting a button or whatever, but that can also get very expensive too. So you want to think about how do you want to balance, you know, the risk of not having a lot of mobile devices in hand to test with how to make sure that you're testing everything you need to test. So, well, and also the the expense of that. So it's like sort of the trade-off, but there are a lot of of good platforms, Sauce being one of them, that offers an opportunity to connect to real devices, simulated devices. So definitely check those out. And then once you've figured that out, then think about the things that are different between a mobile application and a web application. One of the, the things obviously is the OS difference. Another thing is screen sizes. You know, Apple tends to have fewer variations in, in screen sizes. And of course, there's only one manufacturer, Apple. But with Android, you've got device fragmentation. You've got different screen sizes. You've got different operating systems. Something that, like, if, if you're only testing on Samsung Galaxy, you might miss a problem in Pixel. So you want to make sure that you're, you're testing on those. If you are dealing with an application that already exists, like not like a, a brand new project, you can look at, hopefully your company has set up, you know, some kind of, of logging or tracking so they can see what users are using your application, you might find that like 80% of your users are on iOS. So you're going to want to spend more of your time testing there. Or you might find that you've got a whole bunch of users that are using like Huawei devices and like you didn't even have any of those. So you want to find out what your users are doing and then structure your testing accordingly. Then something else to think about is things like carriers. Like are you using, for example, in the US is AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, because there can actually be differences there. I actually, it was a fun story. Um, this is years ago, I was testing a GPS feature in an app and we were finding like some strange things were happening with with like the location of, of you know like the location wasn't coming back in the application and i didn't know why and so i wound up like driving around town with two tablets in my car one was connected to verizon and one was connected to at&t so i was like driving around finding a place to pull over checking the location and it turned out there was a difference between the two like for some reason verizon wasn't pinging as often as at&t was so there can be things like that. And then think about things like the camera feature. Does your app use the camera feature? Think about what happens if you get a phone call in the middle of using your app. I know there's there's a bug that I've seen that drives me crazy where if I'm listening to, I've got like a podcast player that I use. If I'm listening to the podcast, a podcast and my husband calls me while I'm listening, after the phone call is over, I can go back to the app, but when the screen falls asleep, the playback stops. So like, think about that. Think about what's going to happen, you know, with, with your users when, when they get a phone call or when they get a text or something like that. So those are the challenges that you want to think about. And then finally, there's the challenge of manual versus automation. A lot of times people think automation is going to cure everything. Mobile automation is really hard and frustrating. And there are going to be some things while you might be able to simulate them in your automation, it's not really going to be the same. So there's always going to need to be more of a manual component in your mobile testing than you have in your web testing. Hopefully in the future that will change. I mean, certainly web automation has improved so much in the last decade. And so hopefully like a decade from now, we're going to be able to say, oh, mobile automation is fun and easy now. But until then, <laughs> you're going to need to do some manual testing. <laughs> Yeah, everything you said kind of points at the fact mobile testing is so hard and complicated compared to web testing. When, yeah, whenever I try to do some mobile testing, I'm like, my gosh, this is so hard and so painful in so many scenarios to think about. 
Do you have some good resources for us where we can go to maybe learn more about how to do better mobile testing? Well, I can. I've just started reading a book, uh, Hands-On Mobile Testing, but mm. I'm not very far into it yet. <laughs> so I can't, I can't definitely say I recommend it, but so far it's good. I'm only about a chapter and a half in. So there's one book. I think whatever service you decide to use for your automation or for your even for your manual testing like interacting with devices in the cloud i would look at the documentation for that particular product that you're using so for example if you were using sauce labs i would look at you know sauce labs documentation for for some just some suggestions like usually there'll be a blog and like you know here's what you can look at and yeah and so for for other tools like you know for example browser stack or i know amazon's got a device farm you know look at that documentation see what they recommend nothing else is jumping out at me but you know there's so many great bloggers out there and great podcasts and so yeah i would just i would just search and and whenever you hear something that that's actionable you say to yourself Oh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna remember this guy, and I'm gonna come back to it and listen to it some more. Yeah, you, you know what I realized yesterday was I was thinking I'm like, okay, I need to get some people to talk about mobile testing on my podcast, and I was like, there aren't that many people that talk about this. I know like a handful versus talk, you know, testers talking about everything else, and I was like, wow, we still have a long way to go with with mobile testing. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely definitely a growth area. Yeah, and if there's somebody out there who's saying, "Oh, I think I'd like to start a blog post or a podcast or something," and they're wondering like what a good niche would be, that would definitely be a good one. <laughs> For sure, please help us start stuff. Yeah, yeah, awesome. All right, cool. Next topic, which at Sauce Labs when I was a customer facing role, I gotten this so much. People want to test file upload and file download, and so. I saw you had a section on file uploading. I didn't see if you had a section on file downloading, but talk to us about that and how to do it well. Well, this was a really fun project that I worked on. This was a couple of years ago. I was on a team where we were creating a new file upload service as part of our application. And so one of the the most embarrassing things that just it just kept on coming back to bite me over and over and over again was just having a space in the file name like and and it's just something you don't even think about and and it it came back i actually write i have a chapter about this in the book it actually like came back to bite me three times so the first time was it was just like the simple upload and I, I think at that point I had remembered to test with spaces in the file name. I like to think I remembered. And so I found, oh, well, there was an issue. But then there were a couple other things that were happening to the file after it had been uploaded. Because, of course, for security reasons, we wanted to do a security check on the file, making sure that nobody was trying to upload anything malicious. And the tool that we were using to check the security of the file also had a problem with spaces in the file name and then i think the final time it bit me again was i think it was encoding a video because you know you want to make sure that somebody uploads a video you want to make sure that it's been processed appropriately it's been encoded and then the, the user can play it back and once again, same thing. If there was a space in the file name, then it wasn't being encoded properly. So that's definitely the first thing. Another thing you need to think about is extensions, file extensions. And one of the things that I've done that has been so helpful is to have like a file folder on my computer of like a whole bunch of different file extensions that I can use. So that that way, if somebody asks me, hey, can you test file upload, please? I don't have to go searching for those things. Oh, where's my PNG file? Where's my TIFF file? Where's my TXT file? I've got them all right there. So that's really, really helpful. And then another thing that's important to know is that just because a file says dot something, doesn't mean that it's really that kind of file. So you want to make sure for security purposes that that you have some kind of check put in where you're validating, is that really a TXT file? Or could that actually be like a 
.js file that somebody has like mislabeled. So that was uh, really helpful to know. And there's there's different kinds of ways in code that developers can use to check for like bits at the beginning of a file to see exactly what it is. Oh, and then another thing that's really interesting is when you're uploading something like like images, there's GIF, you know, like GIF animated GIF images, and sometimes your application is not configured to handle that. So like, you know, somebody might like, let's say you have like a like a mobile app with like cat photos or something like that, and you're uploading like, you know, all these happy little photos of cats. If somebody uploads an animated photo, you know, of like a little cartoon cat or whatever, that might just break the whole page. So you got to make sure that, that you're testing that out too. And then another really big one is file size. You want to make sure that your application has limits on how big a file you can add because you certainly do not want to be adding a file that's then going to like, you know, completely crash their application or even worse, crash it for everybody. There was a, a situation during this testing, this project that I was working on, we were using a system to encode the videos. We were, we were using a particular provider that was encoding the videos. I'm not going to say who it was, but the way that their application was designed, if somebody else in some other company uploaded too many videos at once, it would like slow down the entire system for everyone. And so there was a point where I was testing and I'm like, why are none of my videos getting encoded? You know, I've uploaded, you know, four of them, nothing's happening. Like they all say they're in process. It was because some other company decided to upload their entire video store to like this, this organization all at once and it broke things for everyone. So you definitely want to make sure that you can handle someone uploading something too big in a way, I mean, ultimate, like the best result would be like reject it, like say, hey, that's too big. You can't upload that. But if you do want to handle that, make sure that you're handling it in a way that it's not going to slow things down for everybody else. Wow. Yeah. So many amazing tips. I have some questions about that. So I've never been part of developing like a file upload system, but from what I understand and have seen it, can't most file uploads be tested with just like a web request by doing like a post to a certain URL with certain information and just test it through that way? Do we, do we actually have to physically upload stuff? It's been my experience that, that, yeah, you actually have to physically upload the stuff. I mean, there are tests that you can do, and we did have some tests using Postman that were like, you know, I'm, I'm going to pretend to upload this file and there's going to be something wrong with my request. Like, you know, like I've got, you know, my file name is missing or my file name has a bad extension or something like that. You can definitely test those things. I mean, that's sort of like the business logic, but to really, really test, you're really going to want to actually like upload that file. And there was a way that, that we were doing that in our Postman tests that where you could actually like have that file sort of on file with, you know, in your Postman collection where, you know, you could say, okay, I'm going to upload this now and it would be right there and it would be ready to upload. And then, yeah, and we haven't talked yet about, about downloading, about retrieving files. And that was very important for us. We had just started using AWS as a, like the S3 as a way of like ha storing our files. And so we definitely wanted to make sure that we could get them back. <laughs> Another interesting thing I learned from that project was, you know, we were using non-relational database and I discovered that, you know, if a file had been uploaded with a certain schema of like how, you know, like what was the information about the file and then the schema changed and we didn't adjust all of the older files, then we couldn't get that older file back like ever. So that was very important. We wanted to make sure that when we were making changes, they were backwards compatible so that people who had uploaded a file like six months ago could still get that file back. Mm, makes sense. And for file downloading, could we also do that with a web request, just doing like a get on a specific URL? Yeah, but uh, I guess 
you want to make sure, even if you're not downloading the file, you want to make sure that the response that you're getting from that yeah. get is is an appropriate one, like a 200 response. Like we had some files where, when I discovered the issue with the backwards compatibility, I was sort of storing GUIDs of various old files so that then I could you know, just request to get them back and make sure that I was getting that 200 response. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing as the upload. Like, sure, you can simulate it, you can test the bi business logic, but you're also going to really want to get that file back sometimes. Mm, okay, sounds good. Makes sense. I have a, also a funny story about a bug that impacted many people at an organization. There was one very large multinational organization I was uh, as that at, and there was one very small change that one developer made, which was a change to our 404 page. And they just wanted to push it through production. I was like, they're like, there's just a change to the 404 page. We changed, you know, these kind of things and that's it. And I kind of didn't even test anything. I was like, okay, sounds very non-threatening, you know, let's go ahead and just push it through. And then we pushed it through and all of a sudden we had like our CI system complaining as we were actually deploying it because we did load balance deploy. So we would deploy to one region, then another. And so as we were deploying it, our system was like yelling at us saying, just a bunch of tests were failing, things were slowing down. We're like, we kind of just ignored it because we're like, oh, it's just, I don't know, something random, you know, and we ignored it, we ended up pushing it through. And what happened was we changed the 404 page to a pretty large size. And we were doing like hundreds of thousands of web requests per second in our organization. And every time the 404 page was returned, it was a huge size. And so that would send a huge payload through the internet. And so it basically shut down the internet for the entire organization. And it was like the wow. most embarrassing thing I've ever was a part of. And I was so sad and I was like, I, I will never let that happen again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of sort of the famous last words of, oh, it's just a simple code change. It's going to be no impact. Like, yeah. Yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to test it anyway. <laughs> yeah, it, it broke so many of our SLAs because it literally took down the internet for the org for like a few hours. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was a really bad and like you said, such an insignificant change, but very significant impact. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Talk to us about security testing. Security testing is so important, especially in this day and age. There are a lot of malicious people out there that are really trying to do a lot of bad things to software, getting information they shouldn't have, taking down a system, etc. And I think the thinking, you know, a few years ago was sort of everybody kind of felt like, oh, well, it's not my job to test the security. That's that's like the AppSecs team, you know, job to do that. But really, security is everybody's responsibility. It's First, it starts with the developers. The developers need to understand how to develop their application securely so they're not leaving those security holes in the first place. But then the next level is it's up to the testers to design tests that are going to catch those security holes. You know, and then after that, then it's like the application security people. So there are so many things that you can do with security testing, and I think a lot of times people think like, oh, it's, it's, you know, you got to use special tools and you got to be able to like, you know, be really smart and think about all kinds of obscure things. And it's, there are things that you can do with that. And there are tools that you can use for that, which are all wonderful, but there are really, really simple things that you can do to test security on your application. And I think back to several years ago, I was working at a company where we were making a new app and I was doing a lot of stuff with test, uh, text fields, just like we had been talking about earlier, testing the limits of those text fields and finding all kinds of things like, hey, did you know that I can put 2,000 characters into this text field that says last name? Like, and maybe that's not such a you know, good idea. And feeling like, oh, maybe I'm being a little too picky about this stuff. Maybe it doesn't really matter. And then later on, a couple of years later, when, when I started working at Paylocity and I started learning about security testing, I learned that that's 
that's exactly one of the ways that people use to to exploit an application is you know they flood a text field with too many characters and they can sometimes use that to actually get data out of the database or get more information about how an application behaves so if you want to get started with with security testing you know just first think about things like text fields and other input points what you know start thinking like a malicious user like what if you know here's our here's our little cat application you know our web app where we're like uploading cat photos like what happens if you put something up there that's too huge what happens if you put something up there that's like you know a javascript file not a cat photo think about those kinds of things and then the next really awesome way to test security is with APIs. You want to make sure that your APIs are locked down. They're, you don't want to be able to do things like make requests unless you have an appropriate authentication token or, or some other kind of, of security, you know, like an API key or something like that. Like your application needs to be locked down. And it is really, really easy to make a whole series of API tests that just test what happens if the, the token is missing? What happens if it's a bad token? What happens if it's a, an invalid token like that's expired? I actually had set up at my company for one particular API that was like basically getting and like adding and retrieving information about an employee. I had created a bunch of tests that were just simply that, like for every API call you can make for every endpoint. There was just, what if it's missing the token? What if the token's expired? What if, you know, the user doesn't have permission? And that actually helped find a security hole. A developer was making some changes to this particular API, and he went and he ran all those API tests. And he was like, oh, why, why is this one coming back as, as a 200 when it's supposed to be a, a 401? And he realized that he had accidentally coded in a security hole. So that's really, really important. After you've done those two levels of like, you know, testing your, your fields, your uploads, and testing your API security, then you can get into things like using tools like Burp Suite is a great tool to help like capture calls and replay them. You know, it looks a little daunting at first, but there are a lot of tutorials out there that can help get you started. And you can learn some really great things with a tool like that. And I've also got a whole section in my book about security testing and, and ways to get started. Awesome. Yeah, definitely everyone check out the whole book. I wanted to capture the resource that you mentioned too. You said Burp Suite by yeah. Port, Port Swigger? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. It's a very odd it. name, but it's a very yeah. useful tool. <laughs> yeah, it's like such a, such a funny name. I hope I yeah. can find it. And it, it was there. There it is. Top yes, result. it's memorable. Right. Maybe that's what they were yeah. going for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, what does that have to do with security testing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. I think one more question for you that I'm super curious about your opinion on. How do we measure quality? Well, I'll tell you how we don't measure quality. I'll start with that. We do not measure quality by the number of bugs that somebody found. We don't measure quality by how many automated tests we have. Those are definitely not ways to measure quality. And a lot of times when a company says, oh, we need to start getting some good quality metrics, that's what they look for. But that is not what you look for. At my company, we talk about different areas of quality. I'm not sure if I'm gonna remember all seven of them, but they are things like valuable, maintainable, performant, secure, functional, accessible or usable, actually usable, accessible, kind of the same thing. Uh, I'm not remembering the seventh, but oh, maybe, did I say performant? I think I said performant. But those, like, think about how to measure those different areas. So if you're thinking about, for example, valuable, like you want to make an application that people are actually going to use. Like it doesn't matter if your application is completely bug free and shiny and wonderful if nobody wants to use it because it's not solving a problem for them. So one way to measure valuable would be what are the app ratings? Like if you have a mobile app, like what, what are the customers saying about this app? Are they saying, hey, it's letting me solve all these problems. I really like it. This is really useful. Is it really easy to use? Like so you can measure something like that. If you're thinking about 
like performant, you need to come up with benchmarks for what does a performant web app look like to you? And then say, you know, have a way of measuring those things and then say, how often were we meeting our goal? For something like functional, which is basically you want the app to work the way it's supposed to, for something like that, you can measure, rather than measuring the number of bugs found, you want to measure something like how many times did we have to roll back a change because there was a bug? Or how many bugs were found in production by customers? That would be another thing to measure. Like you could see, like if, like, let's say you've got like a really buggy application that customers are really sad about and they're always like reporting problems. Like if you see that the number of customer complaints is going down all the time, then you know that you're actually having an impact on your quality. Or if, you know, if for the last like 10 releases you did, you had to roll back five of them because you found bugs after the fact, but then like the next quarter, you only had to roll back two of them, then you're making progress in that area. So those are some ideas of how to measure. Cool. Those are super amazing tips. Another resource I might add, I, you probably have read it, Accelerate. It's a book written by Nicole For Forsgren, and it yeah. talks about also they did a huge analysis of a bunch of organizations and how different high quality organizations perform. And, it's, and they talk a lot about quality and some also cool metrics that we can use to measure quality, such as like how quickly can we release also like mean time to resolve an issue. Yeah. So that's I'll, a wonderful that book. Well. I've read that book and we used that book. We had a, a quality initiative that we started at my company a couple of years ago and we, where we were trying to really get our, our test, our, our, development teams, which consisted of developers and testers, we were trying to get them to like own quality together, not just have it be like, oh, quality is a thing that the testers do. And there were some teams where I got some pushback on that. And I just kept on quoting Accelerate over and over again. <laughs> so, yeah, very helpful. <laughs> that's, <book. laughs> how, that's awesome. And how, how did that attempt to transform the org work out? It's been mixed. There's definitely been a lot of really positive changes pretty much on every team. And we've grown so much as a company that now we have something that we call category quality coaches, where each coach who is a, a software tester is paired up with, with like between three and five teams. And they meet with those teams monthly and help them to set good quality goals so that they can continue to move forward. So that's been really, really successful. There are still some teams that have kind of kept the same old model of, you know, developers write the code and the testers test it. So that's been, you know, I think that's still sort of a work in progress, getting that mindset change. Cool. Yeah, I, I find that a lot of those changes of getting developers to do more testing, be more involved in quality are a mindset shift and the cultural shift. And those two yeah. are typically the hardest to overcome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are definitely some teams that really embraced it. I think probably our biggest success story was there was a team that had two testers on it. The testers had trained the developers, A, in how to maintain and contribute to the automation, and B, how to write like a good manual test plan to check something. And it just so happened that both of those testers wound up being out at the same time for two weeks, and the developers were able to get their entire sprint done with the testing because they had been trained and they knew what to do. So that was really Amazing. awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's super cool. That's a great <laughs> success story. All right, Kristen, what one tip you've given us so many tips already. <laughs> you've given us like, you know, a year worth of trial and error. But what one tip can you give us to create world class test automation? Ooh, world class test automation. I guess I'm going to say treat your automation code as if it is actual like product code. You know, too too often test automation engineers 
don't really care about the quality of their code because they figure, well, what's the worst gonna, that's going to happen if it breaks? You know, like maybe the test won't run. Big deal. It's not as bad as like, you know, if your your production code fails and then somebody can't do something. But if you treat it as valuable as your production code, then you're going to have clean code, maintainable code, code that's going to Oh, like tests that are only going to fail when they really should be failing. So that will be really, really helpful to the organization and you'll be able to move forward much more quickly. That's such a beautiful tip, Kristen. I totally agree with that. I would say one way that I gauge the quality of automation is whether it's actually used as a quality gate in software releases. Yes. If it is used as a quality gate, then that means the entire team and business trusts the automated testing to make a go, no-go decision on that product, in which case that means your code is visible to the entire org and team. And so do you want it to be horrible or do you want it to be great? And probably yeah. it's great if it gets to that point. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Cool. Kristen, where can people learn more about you? Probably the best place would be, I've got a website called Think Like a Tester, which you can find at thinkingtester.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, just under Kristen Jackvoni. I'm on Twitter. And then my book you can get on Amazon. There is a Kindle version and there is a print version. And I've got a GitHub repo that's got some code examples on there. And that's just slash Kristen Jackvoni. So pretty easy to find. That's awesome. And I think you're also speaking at the Automation Guild in February, I right? I am. Yes, I'm going to be talking about the automation test wheel, which we didn't cover today, but it is in my book. And I'll be talking about how to automate things from the test wheel with Cypress. Oh, amazing. So yeah, be sure to catch Kristen there as well, plus all her resources. Cool. Thank you so much, Kristen. It was such a pleasure talking to you today. I had you answered so many great questions and I wish we could keep talking, but I know I want to respect your time and also all the audience's time as well. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. Awesome. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you so much for taking the, your valuable time today to join me on the test automation experience. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the show. So you get a weekly notification on all of the new interviews. If you want to follow me on social media, you'll find that here. And if you want to follow our community, you'll find all of that here. You'll find all the relevant links and show notes in the description below. And if you have any comments, please comment below or use the anonymous form to leave me feedback about the show. I will sincerely appreciate it so I can use it to improve. Thanks so much again. It's been a true pleasure. I've been Nikolai Advalotkin, and I'll see you next time.